welcome back to the Bucket Think Tank. So it's 2018, well, the end of 2018, let's be clear. And I really wanted to talk about sort of the books I read this year, the ones that I really liked, the ones that, you know, really made me glad that I put the time and money into not just reading the books, but also talking about them in the first place, and some books that I just happened to pick up, you know, going through this year when I had the time to sort of sit back and enjoy a good book. And that's always what I think is important when it comes to uh, comics and doing this sort of thing, is that, you know, I could go, I could spend my time talking about all the books I hate, and at some point I will talk about books I legitimately regret reading, that'll be something for next year. But what I want to do right now is just talk about some of my favorite books this year. So first we have Green Lantern Earth 1. We talked about this a bit earlier when the book first came out, but it's still such a good book. Oh, it's still the best Earth 1 book to date. Like Wonder Woman, uh, that, that was... Uh, I'll have to do something a bit more in-depth of that later. A uh, Wonder Woman project I'm working on. But... What I liked about Green Lantern Earth 1 was that it was everything the Earth 1 series should be. A sort of isolated, you know, on its own retelling of not just the character in terms of the name. Like, it's not just the, the origin of Green Lantern, it's the origin of Hal Jordan and sort of playing around with his character. Which is also sort of happening now with the Green Lantern book. But, you know, making Hal Jordan an astronaut and making that he has issues where... You know, he's not a very outgoing person. He's not a very fly-by-his-seat kind of guy. And then even making this story in a sort of post, the Manhunters have taken over and the Greenlands are a myth. And how just sort of sort of stumbles into, you know, bringing back the Greenland Accord and even that having its own repercussions later, which I don't know what those repercussions are going to be, but it looks like the Sinestro Corps or the Yellow Lantern Corps. And, oh, I just... Mm, I, I need this. I need Volume Two to come out soon enough. It was, I think it may be my favorite book of 2018. And then it was Exit Stage Left: The Snagglepuss Chronicles. I didn't think I would enjoy The Snagglepuss Chronicles. It always felt like such a such an out there book, or at least an out there idea. You know, reinventing Snagglepuss as a gay playwright in the 1950s. I never really cared enough about Snagglepuss before. I think most people just knew him for like two things. You know, Exit Stage Left and, you know, Heavens to Murgatroyd. That was kind of it. But here, but here having him as a playwright in the style of Arthur Miller, the story works. And I think it's also because of the talent behind it. Not everyone could have told this story. I think we have to sort of accept that. And the fact that the guy that wrote this also wrote The Flintstones. And those were two, I think of the best sort of progressive books that we could have ever asked for. This was something that DC should be nothing short of commended for because of how they were able to sort of approach what one would call SJW logic in a very well-meaning and well-thought and entertaining way. This is what um, I think quote-unquote SJW writers think they're doing when they write something like America Chavez or or you know, certain X-Men titles. This is what they want to do. And DC just knocked it out of the park, in my opinion. Next was Batman White Knight. So I wasn't quite sure how I felt about Batman White Knight when I heard about it. You know, Joker's apparently sane, and Joker's become, you know, this sort of progressive guy going out and trying to make his own thing work. And the thing is, none of those actually really define exactly what this book is. And... I try to stay away from Joker stories and also try to stay away from new Batman titles because I am a Batman fanboy and I don't like to buy everything or read everything that is Batman because it just, it'll, it'll, it'll consume your life. So what Batman White Knight did was sort of tackle, um, the sort of, a sort of real world approach to what would be Gotham City. And with Joker becoming sane, he calls out, you know, how corrupt the city is, how the GC, how corrupt the GCPD, PD is is how Batman is, and Batman is not only sort of almost the villain in this light, it's sort of a weird, it reminds me of Death Note, where the bad guy, Joker, is doing all this stuff for the right reasons, and you can almost say it vilifies, quote-unquote, the what we would assume is the good guy, L. And you see Batman sort of be pushed to the limit, even at the end, it feels like things have happened and things have changed that none of the characters can ever really go back after that. Like, the only dead weights in that story were Nightwing and Batgirl. They just sort of were there for the sake of being there. 
and we dug up Jason Todd again. That was fun. And sort of at the bottom was Nightwing the New Order. So if you like Injustice, you'll probably like Nightwing the New Order. It just replaces Superman with Nightwing. And instead of going for a full, I'm going to take over the world and become a dictator, it's Nightwing saying, no more metahumans, no more. He be he becomes part of a, pol uh, of a police force and the government that, you know, not only apprehends people with metahuman powers, but also seeks to remove them. And it's it's very Nightwing-esque. To see what breaks Nightwing is, oddly enough, not the story. We don't find out about that until the end. But to see Nightwing as a character who commits to something and then sort of breaks the rules when it doesn't go his way is sort of, I think, very Nightwing in a lot of ways. Sort of very Dick Grayson. And what really makes this story work is the small moments with Dick Grayson, with his son, with his son's mother, with Alfred, and finding out what broke him at the end. I think those were all really great moments. And then we read some other books, some older books, that, you know, weren't even out that would go even beyond last year, Avengers Disassembled. So, yeah, Bendis is writing for DC, and I, he didn't write Avengers, he didn't write Avengers Disassembled for DC, which he probably should have. He really, really should have wrote that. Just, and maybe just because I'm not a really big Avengers fan. Like, I'm reading the, new, the, the current Avengers book, and I enjoyed New Avengers with the Illuminati, but I don't quite know all of them. And so, reading Avengers Disassembled was sort of like, what? What? But the thing, and 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 it, it was it was actually really good. And and if you just want a story that sort of shows exactly how far you can push a superhero team, I think Avengers Disassembled is sort of the best way to do that, at least on that level. It's not like Identity Crisis, which goes, which is which is also part of a much bigger story like Avengers Disassembled. But Identity Crisis just starts falling apart and becomes about something that doesn't really involve what Identity Crisis is about in the beginning, in the middle, and becomes what Identity Crisis is in the background. Avengers Children's Crusade, so I didn't qu I I like Scarlet Witch, but I also like Doctor Doom. So when I found out that Scarlet Witch and Doctor Doom were in a book together, I'm like, I have to read this. The Children's Crusade takes place after the events of House of M, and it's pretty much a search for Scarlet Witch. And what I liked about it was the young Avengers, like are such really, they're just fun characters. I think that's sort of the best way to talk about it. Because even though Scarlet Witch is there, and Doctor Doom is there, the Young Avengers are pretty much what I think the sidekicks were always supposed to be. Someone who looks at the current generation and says, you know, we're here and these problems are here because you haven't fixed them properly. And just to see them call out the past generation of superheroes for their own hypocrisy when they call Scarlet Witch a criminal is, I think, one of the best things ever. Because it also explains the big issue I've had with the X-Men. Why do you guys keep... Why are you guys surprised that people don't like you when you let people like Magneto, who, even on his best day, is a mutant extremist, honor the X-Men, as opposed to just being in jail? It just didn't work. Um, Fall of the Fantastic Four was another surprise. James Robinson has been sort of everywhere for me lately. Like, to be honest, his Detective Comics work is really not that great. His Wonder Woman was, I think, in need of a bit of a more, more of a rewrite. But here, um, Fall of the Fantastic Four is a really great story because it's sort of like the worst day of the Fantastic Four. Like, everything starts falling apart. Ben Grimm is sent to jail. Human Torch is depowered for, like, the tenth time. Reed and Sue lose lose their kids. Um, the Valerius and Latvary with Uncle Doom, and just to find out exactly what happened and what may be the pettiest supervillain of all time. It's just a really great story. It also shows what James Robinson might be best suited, which is being able to tell his own story if you ignore Cry for Justice. And finally, Wonder Woman: The True Amazon. So. I did try to work on a Wonder Woman video, and it didn't quite come out the way I wanted to, and I tried it like three times, and I ultimately had to bury it. But what really made me want to do it was the book Wonder Woman, The True Amazon. So, one of my major criticisms of Wonder Woman is that I don't quite feel the title of Wonder Woman is important to Diana as it is to everyone else. You know, Bruce Wayne, he creates Batman as it's Batman's important to him personally. Uh, Superman's important to Clark Kent. You know, the Trinity should always have that identity be something integral to them. 
And with Diana, it never quite feels that way. And I think it's also because her origin really doesn't matter. That's why it's so easy to make her the daughter of Zeus. Like, her being made of clay doesn't really matter. It matters here. It matters in this story because, hey, she's made of clay. But it goes, I think, what the Earthworm book should have been, which is reinventing Diana as a child, as a spoiled brat. And ultimately, what this story does is make the mantle of Wonder Woman become, well, it's it's sort of a title on Themyscira, and it's supposed to be the best Amazon on Themyscira, on every level, not just in combat, not just in racing, but as a general, all-around, good, upstanding person. And what happens in this book shows that Diana is trying to be Wonder Woman because there was a day when she failed to be Wonder Woman. And the title is more of a punishment than it is uh, a joy. And I love that. I love what that story did. You have to read it, and it might just reinvent how you think about Wonder Woman. Or how you think Wonder Woman should be going. The, my only problem was the art. It felt a bit too much like it could never be part of continuity. At least in my opinion. So, what were the best books I read this year? So, Immortal Hulk, obviously. Oh my god. You know, as someone who doesn't really care about Hulk, I read World War Hulk, and you know, I read, I read some Avengers books where the Hulk's in there, but oh... Immortal Hulk is so hilarious. He's, he really is if the Hulk was the specter fused with Solomon Grundy. And the ghost of Jacob Marley. I, I think that really has to be it. It's really, really great, really frightening. And oh, I didn't think we could do a proper horror story in comic books anymore. Um, Tom King's Batman is another book I've been enjoying. Let, let's just get this out of the way. The Wedding was Stupid. And I don't think it was just the fact that Batman and Catwoman didn't get married. It was the Batcat stuff and the fact that DC built this up with a prelude to the wedding issues, which had nothing to do with the actual wedding, whether or not they did or didn't get married. And as well as it being leaked, it felt really, really poorly handled. And it felt like a missed opportunity. But Tom King has, in some ways, been salvaging it. And the thing about King's run is it's not going to be something like Snyder's run where you can appreciate it as it's happening. I think with King, you're going to have to wait until he's done and you got to look at all of it. And you may have to go back and just reread up to current point and say, okay, I see what he's doing. I see what he's doing because he is doing something. He's doing where I think Snyder's was, again, a Batman story. King's is doing a Bruce Wayne story. And that can be hit or miss. Um, Justice League, speaking of Snyder, um, it was very weird coming into Rebirth and being pretty bored with Justice League. There was, what was it, Dan DiDio once said, it didn't quite feel right if the Trinity weren't working. Like, Batman always sells, but Superman and Wonder Woman have always had a bit of trouble. And I think the same thing has to go for Justice League. Because if Justice League isn't working, if the book where all of your heroes come in isn't working, well then what are you doing? And Snyder sort of comes in and he he does the Snyder. He does, he does exactly what Scott Snyder is supposed to do. Take his characters, beat him up, and he's been handling Batman very well. Because I think if you do Batman wrong in a Justice League comic, he can come off as too OP. He can come off as like, well, isn't that a bit ridiculous? He's kept Batman in his advisor role, in his strategic role. There's no because I'm Batman. And he knows how to handle all of his characters, I think, very well. And I love him for it. But the fact that we're going into the multiverse with the totality, the Legion of Doom, Hawkgirl's back, Jon Stewart's back, Martian Manhunter's back... I think I think if anything, if there's one thing I wanted Snyder to talk about was how Jon Stewart stopped being the leader of the Green Lantern Corps. Just just wanted to know how that happened. Next, Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. So, Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps was a book that, along with Green Lanterns, I thought was going to be really good. And the first the first arc really turned me off because I don't think that book understood Sinestro. And that might be because I loved Cullen Bunn's run on Sinestro and Jeff Johns' take on Sinestro. There's something interesting about Sinestro that I don't think that book really got. It was more the fact that no one quite knew how to deal with the Sinestro story where he, be, where the Sinestro Corps becomes um, the law of the universe, effectively. Where you know they're just they're doing the job the Green Lanterns would do, but then you have to have Sinestro come off as like he's doing something else, and now he has to be toppled down for it. Hell, Jordan the Green Lantern Corps is almost a different take on the New Guardians book, which came out in New 52, which was about all the different Lantern Corps. It actually came out before New 52. It just carried on to it, if I'm not mistaken. But where the New Guardians was about all uh, members from all the Green Lantern Corps working together, this is just about Hal, John, Guy, and Kyle just being Green Lanterns, being space cops. And there's some subtle commentary 
on cops. It usually comes from Jon Stewart. And Jon Stewart says stuff like, you know, the cops have to be held accountable when they do something wrong. And a multitude of other stuff. And the art was so good. And Zod, oh my god, Zod versus the Green Lantern Corps was so, so good. Oh, the return of Ganthet. Oh, and, uh, oh, the Dark Stars. And Hector Hammond and Carol Ferris was back. It was all just, just really great stuff. There was only like one really bad story, in my opinion. But the rest was good. You should read How Join the Green Lantern Corps if you haven't already. Elephant Men, The Death of Shorty. So I came across Elephant Men as sort of just browsing. And it was on sale of Comixology. And I love elephants, by the way. One of my favorite animals. And I'm like, okay, what, what is this about? Oh, oh, uh, sort of human-elephant animal hybrids that are supposed to be like war machines. It was just sort of like, it's sort of like the Weapon X program. But it's darker and and scary. It's really sort of about PTSD in a lot of, especially the death of Shorty. And that story is about Hip Flask, who's like my least favorite of the animal men, uh, trying to solve the murder of, of his friend Shorty. And that is sort of like my only real problem with the death of Shorty comic, is that as good as it is, and it's sort of as gut-wrenching as it is, especially with Yvette, who, the more you look into the Elephant Men story, she's like the scariest person I've ever met. But... Reading the Elephant Man, I enjoy Ebony's character more than I enjoy Hip. And that's sad because Hip is everywhere in the Elephant Man comic. So that's it for the new book. So what am I looking forward to going into 2019? Well, Heroes in Crisis is still relatively new. And I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes and exactly what happened at Sanctuary. I think, we should all, I think we're all sort of wondering that. And just to see where the story goes. Uh, Doomsday Clock, I need to actually start doing a fresh review of Doomsday Clock because I think I stopped at issue one, but I've been reading it the whole time. So that's something we'll be doing uh, next year. Um, Jason Aaron's War of the Realms. So if you recall, when we talked about Mighty Thor, Jane Foster's Thor, we did talk a bit about the War of the Realms because that was the big thing going on in the background. And that is apparently going to happen. It's going to presumably resolve or even start itself properly in, I think, May or April. And we'll be going over that when that happens. Um, Fantastic Four is doing Doom versus Galactus. I'm, first of all, I love Doom. Doom is like the best reason ever to read the Fantastic Four. Alongside Ben Grimm and Invisible Woman. They, uh, but this, oh, oh, Doom. I lo love Doom. Everything is better with Doctor Doom. And finally, Shazam. Um, I've wanted to like this character. I've never really quite had a book that really made me become endeared to him. Um, I think most people like her from the Justice League Unlimited cartoon, at least my group of people who didn't really read the comics but, you know, saw him in the Justice League Unlimited cartoon. Um, that's all the new stuff I'm looking forward to. I'm still looking forward to pretty much everything else I'm reading, whether it's Doctor Strange, whether it's Justice League, Justice League Dark. I'm looking forward to seeing where all these stories are going to go in the next year. And I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing more of you all here on this channel and hearing anything you'd like me to talk about. We do have some other things coming for 2019, some other projects that haven't quite been started, but we'll, we'll go more in depth on them later on. Anyway, with that in mind, we'll bring this video to a close here. If you're new to the Bucket Thing, feel free to like, comment, share, subscribe. Check out some other videos on this channel, and I will catch you all later. This is the Bucket Thing Tank signing off. May your fandom serve you well.